Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God. Well, as you can see here, um, I'm going to be going over this video. A brother of mine sent me this, and uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, as, you, as you'll be able to see, this is uh, President Reagan's address to the United, uh, United Nations in New York City, September 21st, 1987. We're going to be going through this entire video. It's about, uh, it's 32 minutes long, and we're going to be making some stops along the way. But th this is very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. And um, bear with me. As we go through this thing, we're going to be going through, like I said, the entire video with some stops along the way. But before we begin, um, in this video, I'm going to be putting some links in the description box. Um, the uh, documentary about the Jesuit order. Um, also, the video about um, psychological uh, warfare tactics and the media. And also, too... Um, there's another one that I, I'm going to be putting, but I'm going to be putting several links in this video because, um, as you're going to see, it, and this was in 1987, what President Reagan talks about is the ultimate end of the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order wants to bring the entire world back under the reign of Roman Catholicism. Okay, that's the goal of the Jesuit order, to bring the whole world under Catholicism, that it may be ruled by the volition of a single man, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay, that is their goal. That is their goal. And in watching this, and pay, pay attention too, you're going to notice the difference between esoteric and esoteric language. What is that? Esoteric. Esoteric is a form of doctrine of speaking for those who are in the know, okay? A small group who have been initiated, who have specialized knowledge of what is being said, while the other is exoteric, which is something for the general populace, for the general public, okay? And that is a form of double speak, sophistry, the use of rhetoric, okay? He's going to be saying something that some things that the general populace, the general public are going to be getting one thing, but those who are in the know, who have this specialized knowledge, they're going to get it. It's, it's very, the Jesuits did really good with this one, and you will see that, okay? But like, like I said, he's going to be speaking in a form that addresses the general public, but in actuality is speaking on to those who are of the initiated, those who are in the know, okay? All right? But also, too, I want to show you really quickly. This is, as you can see, this is the Godfathers. This is what? Uh, part three of Alberto Rivero's testimony, okay? I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Now, I don't got my microphone uh, hooked up, so... Okay. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. Okay, let me see. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, this is what I'm going to be reading you on this page. Okay, on this page. Hopefully you saw that. Here's what Dr. Alberto Rivera had to say about. <laughs> Here is the link today. It is found in the obelisk, which is a four-sided pillar facing the four corners of the earth. At its peak is a pyramid. It represents a combination both religious and political power worldwide, the temporal and the spiritual, spiritual and temporal swords, the two swords wielded by the Vatican, okay? Have you ever seen, you know, um, pictures of Catholics, of uh, their leaders, uh, where they're doing this? Temporal and uh, spiritual, or spiritual and temporal, okay? The two swords, that's what that means, okay? It appears in Egypt, in the U.S. Washington Monument, and in the Vatican. 
to the Jesuits, Masons, and the Illuminati, it secretly stands for the One World Government. The obelisk, obelisk, obelisk excuse me, is occultic. It represents the sun god, Baal. It also represents life through sex. It is a phallic symbol, the male organ. And sorry for that. I was just reading this, what this said, okay? But that's what an obelisk is. It is a phallic symbol, the male organ, okay? Dr. Rivera explained that when he was under the extreme oath of the Jesuits, he was told that a secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism. In preparation for the signing of the Concordat between the Vatican and the U.S., the sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol, and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20th, 1981. Was the president aware of this? We don't know. <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Very interesting. You've heard, I've mentioned that before. I've, me I've mentioned that to you before in several videos about that. But there is the, um, there's the evidence of it. And I do believe Alberto Rivera was of the Church of the Living God. I really do believe that. And the information that he came out with against the Jesuit order, second none, okay? But with that said, we're going to go through this, okay? Got some, like I said, some stops along the way. Here we go. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome the, to the United Nations the President of the United States of America, His Excellency Mr. Ronald Reagan, and to invite him to address the Assembly. President, Mr. Secretary General, Ambassador Reed, honored guests and distinguished delegates. Let me first welcome the Secretary General back from his pilgrimage for peace in the Middle East. Now, within these first uh, moments of this video, pay attention to the religious rhetoric that he is using, okay? He's going to use terms like uh, pilgrimage, okay? Pay attention to his rhetoric within the first moments of this video, okay? Pay close attention to that. That he is doing a double speak. He is speaking one in exoteric for the general public to hear and digest, while other he is addressing the esoteric, okay? Those who are in the know, okay? So pay attention. Hundreds of thousands have already fallen in the bloody conflict between Iran and Iraq. All men and women of goodwill pray that the carnage can soon be stopped. Pray, okay? Pilgrimage. Do not the uh, sons of Ishmael make a pilgrimage to Mecca every year? And Catholic pilgrimages? Hmm? Okay. And we pray that the Secretary General proves to be not only a pilgrim, but also the architect of a lasting peace. The architect 
of a lasting peace. Now, if any of you know, uh, know anything about Masons, they worship the great or grand architect. Who is, who, is, who is the grand architect, according to Masonry? Lucifer. Who is Lucifer? Satan. Okay? Remember that. Okay? Keep that in mind. The grand architect of the universe. Okay? Satan. And remember, the Masons are here to build their own temples, to make their own little kingdoms. Okay? Keep that in mind between those two nations. Mr. Secretary General, the United States supports you, and may God guide you in your labors ahead. <laughs> what God is he talking Like the Secretary General, all of us here today are on a kind of pilgrimage. We come from every continent, every race, and most religions to this great hall of hope, where in the name of peace we practice diplomacy. And in the name of peace, ye shall destroy many. While we say, while they say peace and safety. Yeah. Now, diplomacy, of course, is a subtle and nuanced craft. So subtle and nuanced craft. Craft. Oh, like the craftsmen of the Masons. Okay. And remember, brethren. The Masons are controlled by the Jesuits, not vice versa, okay? Remember here that uh, Alberto Rivera here, he gave testimony that at the time when he was in the Jesuit order, the uh, superior general of the Jesuits at that time himself was a Mason, okay? The Masons don't control the Jesuits. The Jesuits control the Masons, okay? Keep that in mind. But... Um, uh, craft, that use of craft, okay? Being craftsmen, uh, perfecting your craft, right? That's Masonic. That's Masonic, okay? You talk about, as they say, buzzwords here, okay? So much so that it's said that when one of the most wily diplomats of the 19th century passed away, other diplomats asked on reports of his death, what do you suppose the old fox meant by that? But... True space statesmanship requires not merely skill, but something greater, something we call vision, a grasp of the present and of the possibilities of the future. I've come here today to map out for you my own vision of the world's future. One His own vision. Ha! Yeah, right, right. He was a puppet. Remember, Ronald Reagan, before um, the Jesuits selected him as our president here in America, he was an actor. Okay? He was an actor. His vision? I don't think so. I don't think so. I believe that in its essential elements is shared by all Americans. And I hope those who see things differently will not mind if I say that we in the United States believe that the place to look first for shape of the future is not in continental masses and sea lanes, although geography is obviously of great importance. Neither is it in national reserves of blood and iron or, on the other hand, of money and industrial capacity, although military and economic strength are also, of course, crucial. We begin with something that is far simpler and yet far more profound the human heart. <laughs> the human heart. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Follow your heart. Trust in your own heart, right? Right? Um, Jeremiah chapter 17. What does God have to say about the heart? Jeremiah 17. Verses 9 and verse 10 from the authorized version of the scripture, okay? Uh, by the way, this is not any kind really of video where we're going to be expository or doing anything like that. This is more commentary, okay? So you know. But Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So he's like, it begins in the heart. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, pay attention to what he says here. Okay? Pay attention to this stuff. All over the world today, the yearnings of the human heart are redirecting the course of international affairs. Putting to the wild... To the lie there, the lie to the... In international affairs, their hearts are being, uh, are redirecting, he said, okay? Their hearts are being redirecting, are redirecting, whatever this devil said. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3. <laughs> Verses 1 and verse 5. This know also... That in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Yeah, yeah, let's continue. The myth of materialism and historical determinism. We have only to open our eyes to see the simple aspirations of ordinary people writ large on the record of our times. Last year in the Philippines, ordinary people rekindled the spirit of democracy and restored the electoral process. Some said they had performed a miracle, and if so, a similar miracle, a transition to democracy, is taking place in the Republic of Korea. Haiti, too, is making a transition. Some despair when these new young democracies face conflicts or challenges, but growing pains are normal in democracies. The United States had them, as has every other democracy on Earth. Yeah, in Latin America, Jesuits. too, one can hear the voices of freedom echo from the peaks and across the plains. It is the song of ordinary people marching not in uniforms and not in military file, but rather one by one in simple everyday working clothes, marching to the poles. Ten years ago, only a third of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean lived in democracies or in countries that were turning to democracy. Brethren, to keep in mind, okay, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon, is not a democracy. It's a hierarchy, okay, run by a tyrant, okay, a emperor, a dictator, okay? Remember, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be the one ruler over the entire earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to be given that, okay? This is a smoke screen, okay? Okay? Keep that in mind. Today, over 90% do. But this worldwide movement to democracy is not the only way in which simple, ordinary people are leading us in this room. We who are said to be the makers of history, leading us into the future. Makers of history. Like the Jesuits, makers of history. Because remember, history is written by those who have killed others, right? And it is well documented in uh, well, at least uh, some of the books that I have, about how the Jesuits have rewritten history books. Read or uh, George Orwell's 1984, people, okay? Okay? <laughs> the Jesuits have rewritten history. And also using euphemistic language. Uh, what is a euphemism, by the way? Changing the name of the condition, you change the condition, basically. Okay? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind.
Around the world, new businesses, new economic growth, new technologies are emerging from the workshops of ordinary people with extraordinary dreams. Here in the United States, entrepreneurial energy, reinvigorated when we cut taxes and regulations, has fueled the current economic expansion. According to scholars at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, three-quarters of the more than 13 and a half million new jobs that we have created in this country since the beginning of our expansion came from businesses with fewer than 100 employees, businesses started by ordinary people who dared to take a chance. And many of our new high technologies were first developed in the garages of fledgling entrepreneurs. Now, see that, where he's uh, standing there at that podium? One day, that's going to be that man of sin, the son of perdition, standing there. Just thought I'd throw that at you. But America is not the only, or perhaps even the best example, of the dynamism and dreams that the freeing of markets set free. In India and China, freer markets for farmers have led to an explosion Look at that. Look at that body language. It's like, oh, boy. And the other guy there, look at him, how he's sitting there. Mm -hmm. Very telling in the way that their, their posture and their body language, what they think of the American president. ...in production. In Africa, governments are rethinking their policies. And where they are allowing greater economic freedom to farmers, crop production has improved. Meanwhile, in the newly industrialized countries of the Pacific Rim, free markets in services and manufacturing, as well as agriculture, have led to a soaring of growth and standards of living the Asian nations, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, have created the true economic miracle of the last two decades. And in each of them... <laughs> look, look at that guy, sitting like this. Look at his body language. Closed. He's closed off. Closed off. He's closed himself off. When you see people most of the time sitting like this, usually uh, not listening or going to be defiant to you. Okay? <laughs> very, very interesting. Much of the magic came from ordinary people who succeeded <laughs> as entrepreneurs. In Latin America, this same lesson of free markets, greater opportunity, and growth is being studied and acted on. President Sarney of Brazil spoke for many others when he said that private initiative is the engine of economic development. In Brazil, we have learned that every time the state's penetration in the economy increases, our liberty decreases. Yes, policies that release to flight ordinary people's dreams are spreading around the world. From Colombia to Turkey to Indonesia, Governments are cutting taxes, reviewing their regulations, and opening opportunities for initiative. There has been much talk in the... Opening opportunities for initiative. Oh, oh. Roll that one around in your head a little bit and put that in context with what's going on today. About rewarding people through initiative, you know, giving them in initiatives. Think about that. About in the halls of this building about the right to development. But more and more, the evidence is clear that development is not itself a right. It is the product of rights. The right to own property. The right to buy and sell freely. The right to contract. The right to be free of excessive taxation and regulation of burdensome government. There have been studies that determine that countries with low tax rates have greater growth than those with high rates. We're all familiar with the phenomenon of the underground economy. The scholar Hernando de Soto and his colleagues have examined the situation of one country, Peru, and described an economy of the poor that bypasses crushing taxation and stifling regulation. This informal economy as the researchers call it, is the principal supplier of many goods and services, and often the only ladder for upward mobility. 
in the cap. Now, get a load of what he just said there. Okay, I have here written down, and you check this out. Keep it paused. Do whatever you got to do. Uh, reference Ezekiel chapter twenty-seven with Revelation chapter eighteen, and also take a note Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight verses one on to verse nineteen. Who really runs the world economy? Hmm? And what is the end that justifies the means of all the world economies? That eventually that no man might buy or sell save those who had the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead? Yeah. 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 Capital city, it accounts for almost all public transportation and most street markets. And the researchers concluded that thanks to the informal economy, the poor can work, travel, and have a roof over their heads. And you got to remember what we just listened to. Um, everything that he was talking about is exactly what Catholicism is against. Okay, they're not about freedom in the marketplace. They're not about freedom of any kind. They're tyrants. Okay, okay, they don't believe in free trade, stuff like that. Okay, all right. He spoke one thing for the exoteric, for the general populace, while those who are the esoteric, those who are in the know, knows what he's talking about. Okay? Just remember, everything that this man has said about what, you know, about the economy is the exact opposite of what Roman Catholicism truly believes and will implement here in the very near future. Do not forget that. Okay? They might have added that by becoming underground entrepreneurs themselves, or by working for them, the poor have become less poor and the nation itself richer. Those who advocate status solutions to development should take note. The free market is the other path to development and the one true path. And unlike many other paths, it leads somewhere. It works. So this is where I believe we can find the map to the world's future in the hearts of ordinary people, in their hopes for themselves and their children, in their prayers as they lay themselves and their families to rest each night. These simple people are the giants of the earth, the true builders of the world and shapers of the centuries to come. And if indeed they triumph, as I believe they will, we will at last know a world of peace and freedom, opportunity, and hope. And control the people so that they will build the pyramid. <laughs> the pyramid, right? <laughs> wow. Wow. But put this in context with what is going on right now today, brother. Pretty interesting stuff. And yes, of democracy, a world in which the spirit of mankind at last conquers the old familiar enemies of famine, disease, tyranny, and war. Man will bring in peace. Right? Man will bring in peace. It's not what the scripture says. The only one who's ever going to bring peace is going to be our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. According to this guy, man. According to the Jesuits, man. Man is the one who's going to bring in peace. You caught that, didn't you? Yeah, let's continue. This is my vision, America's vision. I recognize that some governments represented in this hall have other ideas. 
Some do not believe in democracy or in political, economic, or religious freedom. Some believe in dictatorship, whether by one man, one party, one class, one race, or one vanguard. To those governments, I would only say that the price of oppression is clear. Yes, the price of oppression is clear. And what is and what is the clarity there? That man of sin, the son of perdition, <laughs> a return to the dark ages, when Roman Catholicism will rule the world. <laughs> Your economies will fall farther and farther behind. Your people will become more restless. Isn't it better to listen to the people's hopes now rather than their curses later? And yet, despite our differences, there is one common hope that brought us all to make this common pilgrimage. The hope that mankind will one day beat its swords into plowshares. The hope of peace. No place on earth today is peace more in need of friends than the Middle East. Its people's yearning for peace is growing. The United States will continue to be an active partner in the efforts of the parties to come together to settle their differences and build a just and lasting peace. And this month... So man will bring in a just and lasting peace. See? That's not going to happen, people. Okay, that is not going to happen. The only one, according to the scriptures, the only one, again, who is going to bring peace, true peace, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Kingdom of heaven. Okay? <laughs> Marks the beginning of the eighth year of the Iran-Iraq war. Two months ago, the Security Council adopted a mandatory resolution demanding a ceasefire, withdrawal, and negotiations to end the war. The United States fully supports implementation of Resolution 598 as we support the Secretary General's recent mission. We welcomed Iraq's accept acceptance of that resolution and remain disappointed at Iran's unwillingness to accept it. In that regard, I know that the president of Iran will be addressing you tomorrow. I take this opportunity to call upon him clearly and unequivocally to state whether Iran accepts 598 or not. If the answer is positive, it would be a welcome step and major breakthrough. If it is negative, the council has no choice but rapidly to adopt enforcement measures. For 40 years, the United States has made it clear its vital interest in the security of the Persian Gulf and the countries that border it. The oil reserves there are of strategic importance to the economies of the free world. We're committed to maintaining the free flow of this oil and to preventing the domination of the region by any hostile power. The free flow of that oil? What was the, the Iraq war about? Liberating Kuwait and whatnot. It, no, it's about the opiate trade and the oil. Okay, it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with the liberation of peoples, but the confiscating of goods. Okay? We do not seek confrontation or trouble with Iran or anyone else. Our object is, our objective is now and has been at every stage, finding a means to end the war with no victor and no vanquished. The increase in our naval presence in the Gulf does not favor one side or the other. It is a response to heightened tensions and followed consultations with our friends in the region. When the tension diminishes, so will our presence. Now get a, get a load of that. Indifference. Indifference. The only way to have peace, okay, according to, uh, according to what he's talking about, 
is get rid of absolutes. With no victor or no uh, loser, okay? What is that? That's gray area. That's either or, okay? See, compromise. Abandonment of absolutes. Gray area. That's what he's talking about. And for man, for, to obtain peace, according to these devils, get rid of absolutes. Blend everything together. You see? The United States is gratified by many recent diplomatic developments. The unanimous adoption of Resolution 598, the Arab League statement at its recent meeting in Tunis, and the Secretary, Secretary General's visit. Yet, problems remain. The Soviet Union helped in drafting and reaching an agreement on Resolution 598, but outside the Security Council, the Soviets have acted differently. They called for removal of our Navy from the Gulf, where it has been for 40 years. They made the false accusation that somehow the United States, rather than the war itself, is the source of tension in the Gulf. Well, such statements are not helpful. They divert attention. Such statements are not helpful. Not confirmation nor denial. Gray area, you see that? ...from the challenge facing us all. A just end to the war. The United States hopes the Soviets will join the other members of the Security Council. In <laughs> Look at these guys. Look at them. Detached, uninterested, scorn in the one guy. Yeah. Vigorously seeking an end to a conflict that never should have begun. Should have ended long ago and has become one of the great tragedies of the post-war era. Elsewhere in the region, we see the continuing Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. After nearly eight years, a million casualties, nearly four million others driven into exile, and more intense fighting than ever, it's time for the Soviet Union to leave. The Afghan people must have the right to determine their own future, free of foreign coercion. There is no excuse for prolonging a brutal war or propping up a regime whose days are clearly numbered. That regime offers political proposals that pretend compromise, but really would ensure the perpetuation of the regime's power. Those which, which is exactly what he is getting at as he is speaking in his esoteric tongue, okay, to those who are in the know, while he is speaking exoteric, for the general populace. See, there is dual meaning in what this guy is speaking. Sophistry, okay? Okay? Very clever. Uh, this, by the way, this, this guy did not come up with the speech. I'm sure they had the finest of Jesuits putting this together for him. Those proposals have failed the only significant test. They have been rejected by the Afghan people. Every day the resistance grows in strength. It is an indispensable party in the quest for a negotiated solution. The world community must continue to insist on genuine self-determination, prompt and full Soviet withdrawal, and the return of the refugees to their homes in safety and honor. The, world community. the attempt may be made to pressure a few countries to change their vote this year, but this body I know will vote overwhelmingly as every year before, for Afghan independence and freedom. We have noted General Secretary Gorbachev's statement of readiness to withdraw. In April, I asked the Soviet Union to set a date this year when this withdrawal would begin. I repeat that request now in this forum for peace. I pledge that once the Soviet Union shows convincingly that it's ready for a genuine political settlement, the United States is ready to be helpful. Let me add one final note on this matter. 
Pakistan, in the face of enormous pressure and intimidation, has given sanctuary to Afghan refugees. We salute the courage of Pakistan and the Pakistani people. See a little uh, brown nose in there. You saw his little uh, nod of affirmation. You saw that, right? Yeah. Yeah. They deserve strong support from all of us. Another regional conflict we all know is taking place in Central America, in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, huh? Now, he's going to briefly talk about that. Um, you see this book? See this? I've, I've read out of this in uh, several videos. See that? This is what he, he's making reference to this. Okay, what was what this book is about, huh? Um, the propaganda and whatnot during the time, uh, stuff in Nicaragua, okay? This is what he's referencing, stuff uh, that this book is about, just so you know. See this? Get this if you can. Uh, I think this was something like six, by, uh, here, can you see? See? Okay. This is what he's talking about, okay? To the Sandinista delegation here today, I say, your people know the true nature of your regime. They have seen their liberties suppressed. They have seen the promises of 1979 go unfulfilled. They have seen their real wages and personal income fall by half, yes, half, since 1979, while your party elite live lives of privilege and luxury. This is why, despite a billion dollars in Soviet bloc aid last year alone, despite the largest and best equipped army in Central America, you face a popular revolution at home. It is why the democratic resistance is able to operate freely deep in your heartland. But this revolution should come as no surprise to you. It is only the revolution you promised the people and that you then betrayed. The goal of United... Look, look at that. Like, yeah, so what? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? See in the background, too? Look, look at how the... Look at these people. Okay, look at them. Very telling, isn't it? United States policy toward Nicaragua is simple. It is the goal of the Nicaraguan people and the freedom fighters as well. It is democracy. Real, free, pluralistic, constitutional democracy. Understand this. We will not, and the world community will not, accept phony democratization designed to mask the perpetuation of dictatorship. In this 200th year of our own Constitution, we know that real democracy depends on the safeguards of an institutional structure that prevents a concentration of power. It is that which, which prevents a concentration of power. Trading with the Enemy Act. Okay? Trading with the Enemy Act. Under a state of emergency that has never been rescinded. Kamala Harris right now is um, acting upon that state of emergency. Concentration of power. Again, Never mind smoking Joe. Okay? Don't never mind smoking Joe. He's acting. Okay? He, yeah, I do believe he don't go I do believe he's crazy. Yes. But that's an act. Okay? He's purposely doing that to build up Kamala Harris. Okay? Just like Pope Francis. <laughs> and, <clears throat> just like Francis. Okay, he's he's acting a fool to make the pre-Vatican II Catholics irate. Okay, the whole world is a stage to these people. You have to remember that. Okay, oops. Which makes rights secure. The temporary relaxation of controls, which can later be tightened, is not democratization. And again, to the Sandinistas, I say. We continue to hope that Nicaragua will become part of the genuine transformation, democratic transformation, that we have seen throughout Central America in this decade. 
We applaud the principles embodied in the Guatemala Agreement, which links the security of the Central American democracies to democratic reform in Nicaragua. Now is the time for you to shut down the military machine that threatens your neighbors and assaults your own people. You must end your stranglehold on internal political activity. You must hold free and fair national elections. The media must be truly free, not censored or intimidated or crippled by indirect measures like the denial of newsprint or threats against journalists or their families. Exiles must be allowed to return. And what's interesting, okay, what he is saying is good, but if you get this book, you'll find out that this is what the, the Catholics in action, CIA, that is exactly what they did with the freedom fighters, the guerrillas, okay? They use that type, they use the exact methods that he is speaking against in order to uplift the guerrillas, the freedom fighters, okay? What did, uh, what does the scripture say? Don't overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. What is good? There is none good but one. That is who? God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Yeah. Turn to minister, to live, to work, and to organize politically. Then, when persecution of religion is ended, and the jails no longer contain... When persecution of religion is ended, when the church of the living God is redeemed, caught up, and then that man of sin, the son of perdition, will be let loose by the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Yeah, yeah. He's going to end religious persecution because all the world is going to worship the beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ending a religious persecution by bringing in a one-world religion? Yeah. 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 Political prisoners, national reconciliation and democracy will be possible. Unless this happens, democratization will be a fraud. And until it happens, we will press for true democracy by supporting those fighting for it. Freedom in Nicaragua, or Angola, or Afghanistan, or Cambodia, or Eastern Europe, or South Africa, or any place else on the globe, is not just an internal matter. Some time ago, the Czech dissident writer, Václav Havel, warned the world that respect for human rights is the fundamental condition and the sole genuine guarantee of true peace. And Andrei Sakharov, in his Nobel lecture, said, I am convinced that international confidence, mutual understanding, disarmament, and intentional security are inconceivable without an open society with freedom of information, freedom of conscience, the right to publish, and the right to travel and choose the country in which one wishes to live. Freedom serves peace. The quest for peace must serve the cause of freedom. Patient diplomacy can contribute to a world in which both can flourish. We are heartened by new prospects for improvement in East-West and particularly U.S.-Soviet relations. Last week, Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze visited Washington for talks with me and with the Secretary of State, Schultz. We discussed the full range of issues, including my long-standing efforts to achieve, for the first time, deep reductions in U.S. and Soviet nuclear arms. It was six years ago, for example, that I proposed the zero option for U.S. and Soviet longer-range, intermediate-range nuclear missiles. I'm pleased that we have now agreed in principle to a truly historic treaty that will eliminate an entire class of U.S. and Soviet nuclear weapons. We also agreed to intensify our diplomatic efforts in all areas of mutual interest. Toward that end, Secretary Schultz and the Foreign Minister will meet again a month from now in Moscow. And I will meet again with General Secretary Gorbachev later this fall. We continue to have our differences and probably always will. 
But that puts a special responsibility on us to find ways, realistic ways, to bring greater stability to our competition and to show the world a constructive example of the value of communication and of the possibility of peaceful solutions to political problems. And here let me add that we seek through our strategic defense initiative to find a way to keep peace through relying on defense, not offense, for deterrence and for eventually rendering ballistic missiles obsolete. SDI has greatly enhanced the prospects for real arms reduction. It is a crucial part of our efforts to ensure a safer world and a more stable strategic balance. We will continue to pursue the goal of arms reduction, particularly the goal that the General Secretary and I agreed upon, a 50% reduction in our respective strategic nuclear arms. We will continue to press the Soviets for more constructive conduct in the settling of regional conflicts. We look to the Soviets to honor the Helsinki Accords. We look for greater freedom for the Soviet peoples within by the way, if you really want to find a uh, look at some very interesting literature, the Helsinki Accords. Go ahead and check that out on your own time. Yeah. In their country, more people to people exchanges with our country and Soviet recognition in practice of the right of freedom of movement. We look forward to a time when things we now regard as sources of friction and even danger can become examples of cooperation between ourselves and the Soviet Union. For instance, I have proposed a collaboration to reduce the barriers between East and West in Berlin and more broadly in Europe as a whole. Let us work together for a Europe in which force of the threat or force whether in the form of walls or of guns is no longer an obstacle to free choice by individuals and whole nations. So. Disarm people so they cannot protect themselves, but yet are dependent upon the government for their existence, and also blend everybody together. Disarmament and the blending of everybody together. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I have also called for more openness in the flow of information from the Soviet Union about its military forces, policies, and programs so that our negotiations about arms reductions can proceed with greater confidence. Uh, incidentally, I'm going to put in this video the link for Yuri Bezmenov or whatever his name is about subversion. Uh, if you have not seen that video yet, please do watch it. It's <laughs> very telling. We hear much about changes in the Soviet Union. We're intensely interested in these changes. We hear the word glasnost, which is translated as openness in English. Openness is a broad term. It means the free, unfettered flow of information, ideas, and people. It means political and intellectual liberty in all its dimensions. We hope for the sake of the peoples of the USSR that such changes will come. And we hope, for the sake of peace, that it will include a foreign policy that respects the freedom and independence of other peoples. No place should be better suited for discussions of peace than this hall. The first Secretary General, Trig V. Lee, said of the United Nations, with the danger of fire and in the absence of an organized fire department, it is only common sense for the neighbors to join in setting up their own fire brigades. Now that's a very interesting play on words because doth not the scriptures tell us that the elements will be burned with a fervent heat? Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting uh, wording there. Use of his rhetoric there. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Joining together to drown the flames of war. This, together with a universal declaration of human rights, was the founding ideal of the United Nations. It is our continuing challenge to ensure that the UN lives up to these hopes. 
As the Secretary General noted some time ago, the risk of anarchy in the world is increased because the fundamental rules of the UN Charter have been violated. The General Assembly has repeatedly acknowledged this with regard to the occupation of Afghanistan. The Charter has a concrete practical meaning today because it touches on all the dimensions of human aspiration that I mentioned earlier. The yearning for democracy and freedom, for global peace, and for prosperity. This is why we must protect the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from being debased as it was through the infamous Zionism is Racism resolution. We cannot permit attempts to control the media and promote censorship under the rules of a... Look at the detachment. Look, look at that. Look at that lady. You know, closed off. <laughs> just a little thing of mine, you know, just beg your pardon. So-called New World Information Order. New World Information Order. Uh, oh, where was that? Where was that? Here, here, here. Let's, uh, where was that? The General Assembly has repeatedly acknowledged this with regard to the occupation of Afghanistan. The Charter has a concrete practical meaning today because it touches on all the dimensions of human aspiration that I mentioned earlier. The yearning for democracy and freedom, for global peace, and for prosperity. This is why we must protect the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from being debased as it was through the infamous Zionism is Racism resolution. We cannot permit attempts to control the media and promote censorship under the ruse of a so-called New World Information Order. We must... <laughs> and, um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we truly have freedom to speak? I'll, I'll let you figure that one out. We must work against efforts to introduce contentious and non-relevant -rele issues into the work of the specialized and technical agencies. We're oh, like the fear of the Lord? The authority of the authorized version of the scripture? <clears throat> Where we seek progress on urgent problems for terrorism, from terrorism to drug trafficking to nuclear proliferation, which threaten us all. All by the hands of the Jesuits, by the way. Such efforts corrupt the Charter and weaken this organization. There have been important administrative and budget reforms. They have helped. The United States is committed to restoring its contribution as reforms progress but there is still much to do. The United Nations was built on great dreams and great ideals. Sometimes it is strayed. It is time for it to come home. It was Doug Hammarskjöld who said, the end of all political effort must be the well-being of the individual in a life of safety and freedom. Now, Coming up here, pay very close attention to what this man is going to say around the 29 minute mark, okay? Pay very, very close attention, okay? Well, should this not be our credo in the years ahead? I have spoken today of a vision and the obstacles to its realization. More than a century ago, a young Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, visited America. After that visit, he predicted that the two great powers of the future world would be, on one hand, the United States, which would be built, as he said, by the plowshare, and on the other, Russia, which would go forward again, as he said, by the sword. Yet needed be so. Cannot swords be turned to plowshares? Can we and all nations not live in peace? In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, 
we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. Yeah, some outside threat. You heard that. Let's, okay, okay, let's, let's go back, okay? Uh, let's go back to 2906, okay? I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide oh, oh, oh. would vanish. Sorry about that. Head by the sword, yet need it be so. Cannot swords be turned to plowshares? Can we and all nations not live in peace? In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. Some outside universal threat. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. Some outside universal threat. <laughs> You know, with the very first uh, psychological operation that the Jesuits instituted last year, they they were able to get away with a lot of things, and thus proving of how stupid the general populace is. Case in point, the toilet paper scare. Remember that? I can guarantee you, because of that toilet paper thing, Somewhere in the Vatican, the Jesuits were rolling around on the floor laughing. Okay? Okay? But now, with the, the previous uh, psychological operation that they instituted here upon the entire world, okay, um, people are willing to believe anything. Anything. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Okay, now, follow, please follow me along. Okay. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Signs of heaven. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Go to Joel chapter 2. Now, I'm using these verses as example. Okay. Just very simple examples here. Okay. A brother all, uh, did a video where he uh, read in Ezekiel. So, I'm not going to be building off of another man's foundation. And some of you I know to whom I'm referring to. Well, hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having issues here with my the pages here. We want Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and verse 26. Joel chapter 2, 25 and 26. Oh, excuse me. Joel chapter 2, 30 on the verse 31. Excuse me. And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now that's the Lord doing these things before what? The great and terrible day of the Lord come. Shewing signs and stuff in the heavens. Okay, in the heaven, the sky, you know, okay, spiritual phenomena, okay, now go to Luke chapter 21, okay, 
Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. Okay, now, granted, dispensationally, okay, this is under the law, talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, or what we have looked at, and stuff like that, but, but, okay, a universal outside threat, and there shall be uh, Luke chapter 21, verses 25, on to verse 26, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Go to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter. Okay. Brad, you don't believe in aliens? Oh, you mean little green guys from outer space? No. No, I don't. No, I don't. Think about this too, brethren. Okay, I did a video a while ago where I mentioned uh, the zombie apocalypse about how, um, uh, what was that, uh, programming, um, uh, something programming, uh, predictive programming, excuse, uh, excuse me, through predictive programming, how through the film industry, Hollywood, the zombie apocalypse, okay, way back in what, the 50s, about the Day of the Dead, okay, instilling on people the zombie apocalypse. People are zombies today right now, not thinking for themselves, okay? Remember the War of the Worlds? Okay? The predictive programming of an alien invasion? Independence, uh, Independence Day. Aliens, okay? Predator, all right? Uh, and all these other alien movies, okay? Predictive programming. Way back when, with the movies, Hollywood and whatnot, programming and conditioning. And now all of a sudden, they're coming out with evidence of maybe other world life forms and using euphemistic language, going from UFOs to UAFs now or whatever it is, using euphemisms, okay? Yeah, yeah, and this was back in 1987. See, they're following a script, people, and they're following that script to the T. Yes, there are some divergence here and there, yes, but they're following a script to bring in that man of sin, the son of perdition, and the one world government, the one world religion. But see, the problem is, the Church of the Living God is still here on the earth. And through the predictive programming of the zombie apocalypse from the Day of the Dead, way back in the 50s, also the War of the Worlds, incidentally, Orwell, uh, uh, by Orwell, too, I think, talked about that, or what's that other guy? Some other people. But point is, through media, through Hollywood, through propaganda, you have been being conditioned for this. And now, what better way to bring everybody together today, now, under such duress by the very first psychological operation that they brought in, now to introduce this other one. To do what? Bring everybody together. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 on to verse 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The thumbnail I'm going to put on this video you're going to see about Aleister Crowley, about, you know, the big-headed aliens with the big eyes. On the other side, there's a, what it says on the picture there, demon, a devil. 
No, I don't believe in aliens from another planet, another world. No. It's devils. Spiritual. Okay? Aliens from another world? No. Devils. Okay? Devils. Right? Now, there will be things leading up before the uh, catching way of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. But you have to remember, okay, people have been conditioned for this through the fantasy of Hollywood and movie, okay, and propaganda, the War of the Worlds, I keep mentioning that, Independence Day and so on and so forth, okay? Think about this. Think about this. Okay? Even him, verse 9 on verse 12 in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, an outside external universal threat or whatever he said. E.T. is out there. They're coming for us. <laughs> and um, oh what, how many people are going to fall for this people were so willing to be duped and fall for the lives of, lies of the very first psychological operation that they brought in here okay their trial browns and trial runs okay you all know what I'm referring to, okay? <laughs> now they're going to bring this in? Brethren, the Lord has called you to do something. Get to it. Time is running out. You, you're lost watching this. Wow. And even you, my enemies. You see what's... Then again, I, I truly believe a lot of you, the enemies, uh, do work for the Jesuit order. But even... Okay, let's just for a moment say that you don't. Okay? That you're just crazy devils. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations? Mm -hmm. yet, yet need it be so, cannot swords be turned to plowshares? Can we and all nations not live in peace? In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. <laughs> and abracadabra, hocus pocus. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. 
And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? Two centuries ago in a hall much smaller than this one, in Philadelphia, Americans met to draft a constitution. In the course of their debates, one of them said that the new government, if it was to rise high, must be built on the broadest base, the will and consent of the people. And so it was, and so it has been. My message today is that the dreams of ordinary people reach to astonishing heights. If we diplomatic pilgrims are to achieve equal altitudes, we... Diplomatic pilgrims. Oh, maybe initiated? Jesuits? Right? Again, note that religious rhetoric. We must build all we do on the full breadth of humanity's will and consent and the full expanse of the human heart. Thank you. God bless you all. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. That, that, yeah. 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 So, What's the whole goal? What's the whole goal of this? Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. As you heard this guy talk about bringing everybody together, if there was an alien threat. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 under verse 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us... Build us a city and a tower whose top may reach on to heaven. You shall be as gods. Reach on to heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. See, bringing everybody together. We want to make a tower to reach on to heaven. I've, I've talked about this in several videos, but it... It needs to be said right here. This is what Catholicism wants to do. Catholicism um, has said that the dispersing of people, Catholicism calls that the error of Babel, that they were dispersed boldfacedly out of the Ducat Catechism in talking about social media, okay? Roman Catholicism called this what the Lord did the error of Babylon. Okay? And that's what the Jesuits are doing through this smokescreen ecumenical thing, which is going to go away <laughs> very soon, I believe. Okay? Trying to bring everyone under the headship of Rome. See? Okay? And they're going to, they're using all their daughters to do so. Right? And the Lord came down to see the city and tower, which the children of men build it. Because remember, according to the, what you just heard, it's up to man to bring in peace. Right, right. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. And the thoughts of men's hearts are only evil, desperately wicked. And you heard Mr. Reagan say it's about, you know, the human, human, human heart. Yeah. Yeah. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. 
that they might not, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. He didn't destroy it. They left off. Okay? Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I know that there are a lot of you who have this big problem with the fact that our Lord God, our Father Jesus Christ, is a God of distinction. I know a lot of you have a problem with that. Okay? God is a God of distinction. He likes variety. Okay? All right? I know a lot of you have a great, big, 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 big problem with that. Because Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism, and her army, the Jesuits, are busy right now trying to bring everybody together. God does not want that, people. <gasps> now, I'm not talking about as pertaining to salvation. If you're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, it don't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, okay, man or woman, barbarian, Scythian, for you are all one in Christ Jesus as pertaining to salvation, okay? All right? But culturally, that's a different story. And I know a lot of you have a big problem with that. I know you do. The fact of the matter is, God wants things separate. Did you not, were you not following along in Genesis chapter 11? Yeah. What happens when everybody gets together? Let us build a tower. Make us a name. We will, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What the, with an alien threat now? Oh, brethren. And you people out there. Oh. Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17. Let's read verses 22 under verse 28. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. The new, uh, excuse me, the Bibles say religious, most of them. Okay? There's a difference between religion and superstition. Okay? For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Okay? Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Church buildings, <clears throat> blown away. Get that, no, okay? There's no basis for church buildings in the scriptures, okay? Okay? That comes from paganism, from Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And you got these wicked devils trying to bring you into these things. And the whole world is going to worship the beast during the time of Jacob's trouble, where are you going to worship at? Where do, you, where do people worship at today, right? Brother Alexander Hartley did a couple of videos about that, which I'm going to, if I can remember, I'm going to link in this video as well. Very, very good. Pay attention, okay? You, you, uh, the Lord uh, will teach you something through that, brother, okay? But let's continue. Neither, verse 25, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath 
and all things. Now, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to for to dwell on all the face of the earth. One blood, man's blood. Yes. Okay. We are all descendants from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay. And Noah, of course, trace that back all the way to Adam and Eve. Okay. We are all descended from Adam and Eve. Okay, you, using this correctly, you idiot atheists, we did not come out of a body of water as a sniveling snot and then morph into a monkey to become what we are today. Okay, that's absurd. Okay, that's absurd. We all have one blood. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Bounds of their habitation. Boundary of their habitation. Habitation, where they're going to live. Boundary, where they're going to be located, relegated to. Okay? Yes. Yes. As I once, uh, many, many years ago, um, a black man said unto me, if I were to cut you and you were to cut me, what color would our blood be? Red. Yes, we all have the same blood. Yes, we do. Okay, we do. Bravo. Yay, we do. But as far as cultural things are concerned, okay, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Okay, God wants things separate. You over here, you over there, you over there, you up here, you down there, so on and so forth. Separate. Okay? Separation. I, I know you got a problem with that. Okay? But look at what Catholicism, Mystery Babylon is doing right now. Did you not pay attention to this? Okay? Bringing in alien threats and bring everybody together to fight against this alien invasion so that when we're all together we make a name for ourselves build a tower that reaches on to heaven do you not see okay god likes distinction variety he the bounds of their habitation Boundary, habitation, where people live, okay? Yes, we all have one blood, but there is differences within kindreds, people. And God wants separation, okay? I know you got a problem with that, but you're going to have to get over that, okay? And there is so much beauty in the distinctions, there's so much beauty in it. But see, Roman Catholicism wants to bring it all together so that the whole world will be ruled by the volition of a single man. That man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay? Verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, he has allowed you to live. If you're watching this, you're breathing today, that's because the Lord has allowed it. And for in him we live and move, and have our being. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, created you, whether you want to accept that or not, whether you want to believe that or not. Okay? As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Yes, he created us all, but not everybody knows him as to a relationship. Okay? To uh, what? The video that I did about the three books, if I can remember, I'll link that in this video as well. Okay? Listen, look at me. Look at me, okay? Listen. I know a lot of you have a problem with this. God is a God of distinction. Okay? God is a God of variety. 
Genesis chapter 11, it is very clear. Everybody got together and they made a tower to reach up onto heaven to make themselves a name. Ye shall be as gods. Okay, that's very, very clear. Also, Acts chapter 17 is also very, very clear. Okay, God is God. Distinction. Okay, look, look outside your window sometime. Okay, okay, look out there sometime. You'll see. God is a God of distinction. What is that in uh, Romans chapter 1? Oh, there, come on. Romans chapter 1 in your authorized version of the scripture. Romans chapter 1. Uh, come on, fingers. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. See, again, you're an atheist. You're a liar. You do believe in a God yourself, which comes to you from your father, Satan, okay? Who uh, counts the things of men, not of God, okay? You look out there, that didn't happen by accident. It was created, okay? There are different horses, even though they're horses. There are different dogs, even though they're dogs. There are different birds, even though they're birds. And the third one is a part of the uh, Satanic Roman Catholic Trinity. Okay? We are man. But there are differences in man, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? And those distinctions show the beauty, the beauty of our Lord's creation. Beautiful. Beautiful distinction. The distinctions are beautiful. And that is the way God has designed it. Now, when you're talking about salvation, that's different. Okay? As pertaining to salvation, that is a different thing. Okay? Galatians. Go to Galatians. Okay? Galatians. Chapter. Uh, what is that? What is that? Galatians. Chapter 3, verses 26 on to verse 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, talking to those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Okay? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Okay? There is neither Jew nor Greek baptized into Christ, put on Christ. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Today, in this dispensation, there is neither bond nor free. Today, in this dispensation, there is neither male nor female. Now, now that one ought to, you know, that one ought to just... <laughs> okay, I got this a distinction between man and woman. Okay? That bloop, okay, yeah. But in Christ, neither male or female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, grafted into the tree of the Jew, and heirs according to the promise. So as pertaining to salvation, there is no distinction. Today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? Yes, salvation, salvifically, okay? There is no distinction. Outside of that, there is distinction. There is distinction, okay? And Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Roman Catholicism, and her army, the Jesuits. You know, <laughs> Vatican II, okay? 
Okay, an ecumenical masterpiece. All right, bunch of lies and smoke screen. You know, blowing smoke right up. Never mind. Okay. See, God wants separation. The devil wants everyone to come together because he wants to rule them all. Do you get it? And an alien threat? No. What else can I say? What else can I say? It's going to be it for this video. Um, I'm going to be putting a lot of links in this video. Hopefully this video stays up. Hopefully. Hopefully. I hope so. So, anyway, thank you very much for watching this. If you do, please consider these things. And um, we will see you in the next video. Okay? And thank you, brother, for sharing this with me. Love you. Bye. Uh, how do we stop recording?